Uh, hey, my name is Jared, and I'm one of the lead pastors here at Soul City. Welcome to Soul City Church. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's Happy birthday. That's right. How did you know? How did you possibly know? Oh, Jeannie told you. Uh, thank you very much. It's birthday month for me, so you're welcome to celebrate at any time. Uh, glad you're a part of the party. Uh, we are uh, in the middle of a teaching series called Red Flags. We just saw a bunch of those in that video, and there's a whole lot more. Just a side note, all the red flags done by the dude. Shocking. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, we're going to be kind of getting into that. For those of you who are here in the room and with us uh, today, isn't, aren't you glad you're here in this space? Those of you who are here, you went through a lot of things to actually be here, and I'm so glad that you are actually here. There's something different when we gather together like this. And so thank you, thank you. And for those of you who are worshiping with us online, thank you for joining with us. Just give us a shout out as we do each week in the comments where you're joining us from because we would love to know how God is using this work of this church to reach people literally around the world. So let us know in the comment section. And I guess I have to say it, happy Super Bowl Sunday. Happy, yep, yep, yep. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Galentine's Day. Happy Palentine's Day. Whatever, whatever it is you're celebrating, just happy it to you. Uh, before we get into the message, there is something that we're celebrating all month long, other than my birthday, way more important, and that is Black History Month. And as you are here, uh, we're celebrating as a church throughout our church throughout the month. And if you were here last week, you heard me say that black history, there is no American history without black history. It's essential to our story. And that black history is way bigger than American history, right? It's way, way bigger. And so what we want to do is each week we want to honor and recognize a spiritual giant from our city and today I want to honor the queen of gospel herself, Miss Mahalia Jackson, Southside's own Miss Mahalia Jackson. In reading about her life, I came across, the, across this quote from Lonnie Bunch, and he said that to speak of Mahalia Jackson's voice is to speak of magic and mystery and majesty. Hers is not a voice, it's a force of nature. It moves with the power of a tornado and it soothes with the tenderness of a spring rain. Isn't that beautiful? I don't know if you've ever heard Miss Mahalia Jackson sing, but it is life-changing stuff. Now, she lived here on the South Side in the Chatham neighborhood. She was actually one of the first people of color to move into that all-white neighborhood and did not get a very warm welcome from them. But it was her voice and her records. I've had one of her records for many, 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 many years. It's her voice and her records that actually moved gospel music from churches like this literally around the world. She sang for presidents. She sang for kings and for queens, and it was her voice that Dr. King would call upon both publicly and personally and privately to be the soundtrack of the civil rights movement. It was her voice that can be heard. If you listen, about halfway through Dr. King's speech at the Lincoln Memorial, he's going through his prepared notes, and just over his right shoulder, someone yells, tell him about the dream, Martin, because they had spent so much time together. She knew about this vision that he had of this dream, and at her prompting, King slides his notes over. You can see this. And from the top of his head and the bottom of his heart gives our world one of the greatest visions of racial equity it has ever heard and ever seen. And so today we honor that voice. We honor the queen herself, Miss Mahalia Jackson, knowing that every sacred song we sing is somehow better because she was in this world. Can we honor God and bless God for this amazing woman, Chicago's own? Well, we are in week two of our Red Flags teaching series, and we all know what red flags are. We just saw them in that video, and what we want to, be to, do, is, we want to do is be the type of people that can spot red flags, not only in others. I think we're, we're pretty good at like, oh, that's a red flag. Oh, that's a red flag. Here's what we want to get really good at. Oh, that's a red flag. Oh, that's a red flag. We want to be able to spot them in ourselves. And if, in case you missed uh, last week, because we kicked off the series, all I can say is, Whew, last week was a powerful week for our church. And if, if you missed it, you can catch up online. Please do, because God is using that message to help break chains in families. And I, I would love for you uh, to really, really, really have that happen for you. So you can listen to that. This week, we're looking at red flags in how we see ourselves. And how we see ourselves is incredibly important because it, it affects how we see others and how we see and engage with God. How do you see yourself? Who do you let speak into who you are? Now, about a month ago, I got a little flashback of who I was, and it helped me understand a little bit more who I am. Someone found an old yearbook picture of me and sent it to me. And I looked at the picture, and it was like a wave of memories, like, who is this kid? 
Who is this guy? What did he even know back then? And I, I can remember just like real quick, I, my senior year in high school, I had come to the conclusion over that summer before senior year that there, there just simply wasn't enough coverage of me in our yearbooks each year. Like I'd go through each year, I'm like, there's just not enough of me. And so senior year, I joined the yearbook team specifically with the sole purpose of putting my mug on as many pages as possible and mission accomplished. If you see our senior yearbook, you can't go three pages without finding me somewhere. In fact, true story, I actually throughout the year posed with multiple sports teams that I wasn't even on (laughs) just to see if I could get away with it. And I didn't. I had to pay for all the reshoots of every team picture. I, listen, it was a learning lesson for me. Now, I, I, don't, I don't know if they do this anymore, uh, but there were, maybe you had your yearbook or you still have it, or you can think back to it. The senior superlatives, the, the things they would say uh, most likely to, our, our yearbook didn't do that for some reason, but you know, there's a picture and they'd show their picture in the yearbook and say, this person's most likely to be president or most likely to blah, 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 blah. And I was thinking about that because that can so define how we see ourselves is how others see us. And I thought maybe I could do some senior superlatives. So I went to the World Wide Web, and I pulled some actual senior portraits, and I, I came up with a few of my own. Let me know if you think these apply. Here's the first one. Uh, most likely to run the tech company that runs your life. True or untrue? Probably true. That guy's probably going to do it, right? Next one. Uh, most likely to drive a sweet Camaro. Yeah, <laughs> Pro- yeah probably true. Also, he had two, actually. Uh, most likely to be 32 years old. That is not a teenager. That's a full-grown man. I don't know how that's a senior portrait. That's a man. Uh, Most likely to work at medieval times or was currently working at medieval times. And then the last one is just, I think, very applicable today. Most likely to be a millennial worship leader. I mean, that that could have been taken, that that look is hot right now. That could have been taken right now. Now, we didn't have those in our uh, yearbook, but we did have uh, the senior awards. Maybe your yearbook had those. Where people are, the whole senior class voted and then they would say, like, who was the most athletic? Or who was the cutest couple? Ooh, ooh, red flag. Or who, you know, who was this or that, right? And uh, it, I went to, I've shared with you before, I went to a, a Christian school, and so one of the awards at my school was most spiritual. Some folks are going to have to sort that out with God when they get to heaven, because people won that every year. Uh, so that's not the one I wanted. Uh, the one I wanted was the coveted best dress award, because everyone knows that's the real winner right there, best dress. And so I went, my senior year, I went all out. I mean, I knew I was going to get most academic. So I went out for best dress. And again, I was putting myself in every picture just so so people would know. Imagine my surprise, though, when I found out when the voting forms were handed out to our senior class that they removed that category our year. Our year was the first year that best dressed wasn't an award. Can you imagine how devastated I was in that moment? And it wouldn't be later in the yearbook until it kind of came out and we put it all together that I saw what a jury of my peers actually found me guilty of. And they found me guilty of cutest smile. That's actually, yeah, yeah. I mean, categorically, that is a cute smile. You can't, very cute smile. You cannot deny that. Uh, that, that, Let's be honest. That's not what I was going for. I wanted them to see me differently. I wanted them to see me in a different way. And that's so often what we do when it comes to our identity. And this is so often where red flags are formed because of how much we let our identity be formed by others and how they see us and how they perceive us. And it starts at such a young age. It starts with your parents or, or teachers or coaches, right? Or love interests, right? We, we get all kinds of data from what we're supposed to be or who we're supposed to be from them or from heartbreaks or heartaches. Eventually, it's our coworkers and our bosses and even our spouses, which brings up, I think, a critical question for each of us to consider when it comes to your identity, who you really are. And the question is this. It's who do you say gets to say who you are? Have you ever thought about that? Like, who do you say gets to say who you are? Who are you allowing to define you, to speak into who you are? Who back then, who now? See, so often what we do is is we go looking out there to determine what's in here. We go out there looking and say, who gets to say, who gets to speak into to determine what's already been established in here? We go outside of ourselves looking for ourselves And most importantly, we go outside of the one who actually made us from the inside out. And before we knew it, we can totally lose who we are, lose ourselves, lose your identity, lose your sense of self, lose your sense of purpose. 
Like a, like a, it's like a slow, like a really slow, drawn out identity theft that happens over years upon years upon years. It's like identity theft. I lose who I am. And that's exactly what actually happens in the story that we're going to be looking at today in the Old Testament. One of my favorite stories from the Old Testament. I was obsessed with the story as a kid, and it's only now as an adult that I can see all that God has in it for me, and I believe for you, when it comes to our identity and red flags, how those can actually pop up. They're all baked into the story. And what the story reveals is that, though, again, like everything we're going to look at this month, the red flags aren't out there. They're actually in here. When we fail to see who God intends us to be, who God created you to be, and the kind of relationship then out of that that he longs for you to have. So you need to grab a Bible because we're going to be diving into this story, and it's found in Judges 14. So if you're in this room, go ahead and grab a Bible and open to Judges 14. Go ahead and grab a Bible. It's on page 175. So Soul City Bibles, grab them. It should be on your seat. If you're with us online, you can actually just open up a separate tab or open it up on your phone or whatever it may be to Judges 14, Old Testament. Let me give you some quick context because it's going to help set up the story because we're going to be skipping over a lot of parts of the story. Uh, Samson was actually one of God's judges that God used to help lead the people of Israel between their time of deliverance out of Egypt and their formation as a nation which would eventually be ruled by kings. And something you need to know about Samson is that there was a part of his identity that was established and set apart from his birth. God tells Samson's parents that he is to take the Nazarite vow. And you may or may not be familiar with this, but basically the three tenets of the Nazarite vow are as follows. This is like a, an outward display of inner devotion to God. And so under the Nazarite vow, you are not allowed to go near a dead body or a carcass because it would make you unclean. You're not allowed to drink wine or even eat grapes, and you're not allowed to actually cut your hair. So it's, again, these are all sort of outward portrayals. To, to, so God was using Samson like a living metaphor for what it looks like to be wholly and solely devoted to God. And this Nazarite vow is incredibly important for the story we're about to walk through, and there are multiple red flags that are gonna pop up along the way. So put a mental pin in that, because we will... Come back to it. Now, the text also tells us something about Samson that whether you're even familiar with the story or not, you probably already know, is that Samson was gifted by God with superhuman strength. You familiar with that part? Even if you've never heard the story, he was gifted with superhuman strength. Like we imagine someone, the mental picture here is someone insanely ripped, right? I mean, it, like if you're a visual person, I mean, I guess you can just look up here. Like, if you're looking for, no, because I want to help you get this idea. I want to know. Okay, so, okay, if you need a real, that's not me. If you want a real mental picture, imagine if The Rock had a baby with The Rock. That's like, that's what, that's what we think of when we think of Samson. In fact, I have a, a picture from childhood. This is the image I grew up with when I would hear this story. This super huge Rip dude. Well, here's a fun Bible fact for you. There's actually no evidence that he looked anything like that. I mean, think about it. If he were so huge and so ripped, how would his strength actually be that special or that significant or point to the power of God? If anything, what you should probably imagine as a mental picture for Samson is your ninth grade algebra teacher. That's probably what he looked like. And his strength was so such a like sign of God's power within him. So Samson has an identity established by God. It was special. He was given a super strength, but he also had a super weakness, and that was women. They were his kryptonite. And as we'll see, he's about to go through some real identity theft, especially in the context of relationships. And it starts when he meets a Philistine girl. Now, the Philistines were the mortal enemies of Israel. And so he sees and is attracted to a woman that's a part of the enemy tribe. Okay, so now let's get into it. A lot of context. Judges 14, verse 1 says this. Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. Again, this is a woman that's a part of their mortal enemies at the time. And when he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now, get her for me as my wife. Um, red flags. Lots and lots and lots of red flags so far in the story. First of all, he wants to marry a woman based solely off of her profile pic. I mean, he literally just sees her. He's like, I'm going to marry her, right? And then next red flag is he says he gets his parents to actually go like do that for him. Oh boy. All right. So we're starting really strong with Samson here. So as he was on his way down to meet this woman that was, I guess, his bride at this point, it was just happening. 
He comes across a lion, which would stop you in your tracks probably. I don't know when the last time was that you came across a lion, but he came across a lion. And this is what's so interesting. Again, it comes back to what set him apart, but where we begin to see the first red flag in his identity theft. Uh, Judges 14, 6. So the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. Gross, don't tear any animal apart. Anyway, but he told his, neither his father nor his mother what he had done. Now this is very, very, very significant. And then it says this, I love this. Just verse seven, I, I put this in. Right after ripping a lion in half, then he went down and talked with the woman and he liked her. <laughs> All right. All right, Samson starting strong here. All right, I kept that verse in because I think it's so good. Like he finally gets to go talk to his bride and good news, he likes her. I just hope he washed his hands after the whole lion part. Okay, now why is this so important? Remember I told you to put a mental pin in the Nazarite vow and what do we see Samson doing right here with that lion? He kills it and therefore now he has touched a dead animal and what's the first part of the Nazarite vow? Don't go anywhere near any dead thing. And so already, that's why it says in the text, he didn't tell his mom and dad. He knew. He knew. Red flag. Already he was forgetting. Already he was forfeiting his identity. That relationship with, between the two of them didn't work out for reasons. And years later, actually, after that relationship was well over, Samson falls in love with another Philistine girl. And so this is now over in Judges 16. Jump over to Judges 16. Verse four, it says this, says, sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley, this is important, the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah, ever heard of her. So he now falls in love with another Philistine woman. Now, why does the Bible give us that specific about the valley of Sorek? Why is like lots of times we read those things like, okay, never been there, don't know. The reason it's important is because that area, that valley, that region, specifically in Sorek, was known for their vineyards. They had exquisite wine in that region. In fact, it was known throughout the land for specifically their grapes and their wine. So it's safe to assume while Samson is there <laughs> falling in love with a Philistine woman named Delilah in the Valley of Sorek that he probably had a grape or a wine, which again goes back to the Nazarite vow. Remember the second thing is don't have a, any wine and don't touch a grape. Notice, every time Samson is giving away his identity, every time there's an identity theft, it's always for him and his story in the context of romantic relationships. There's something there about that in his story or his pursuit of those relationships. So eventually he falls in love with Delilah, and given what we know of Samson, it was, probably took five minutes and his parents were involved. And okay, so and here's the thing. So they are a thing now, they're an item, they're a couple. And the Philistines come to Delilah and they say, hey, listen, we hate this guy. <laughs> this guy has been like tormenting us for years. And he's, every time we've tried to attack, he's defeated us. So you're with, you're with Samson now. Okay, Delilah, we're going to pay you all this money so that you can find out what the secret of his strength is. He should not have this strength. Remember, it's the secret of his strength. He shouldn't have this. Delilah, tell us, find out what it is. And that way we can defeat him. And so she began asking him and asking him, tell me, tell me, tell me, what's the secret? What's the secret of strength? I just love this. Verse 16, Judges 16, verse 16 uh, says this. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was what? Until he was sick to death of it. I only put that in there for those of you who are parents because you know that prodding that comes after you, and finally you're just sick to death of whatever it is. And so eventually he gives in. He's just tired of her asking, what is it? What is it? How do you have your strength? And so he gives in, and he begins to break the last part of the Nazarite vow, which was at the center of his God-given unique identity, and that was his uncut hair. Verse 19 says this. After putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair, and so began to subdue him, and his strength left him. And then she called out, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. Like, oh no, I'm so surprised. But this was the plan all along. He woke up from his sleep and thought, I'll go out before they get here and shake myself free. But he, this is so important. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. He did not know that that spirit of God, that power of God, that unique imprint on his life of God was gone had left him. That's it. 
He had given up that last part of what set him apart from the Nazarite vow. Remember that? Don't ever cut your hair. And he allowed that to happen. He allowed that to happen. And soon after, he was captured by the Philistines. And, and it's a tragic tale. They tortured him and humiliated him. They even gouged his eyes out, blinded him. And this was his kind of final wake-up call. And in one last moment, at the end of his life, God gives him the gift of strength. And he's able to actually defeat his enemies. But the real moral of the story was he was defeated. He had already lost who he actually was in God. It's a tragic tale of identity theft. And again, in this story, it didn't happen in a moment. It happened over time. It happened over time. It happened as he lost who it was that God said he was. It happened as he looked to others to kind of speak into who he was. He forgot it, and it ultimately cost him his life. And while the stakes and circumstances of our lives hopefully do not match Samson's, I bet all of us can find ourselves a little bit in this story, can't we? My hunch is, is you've had times, you've had people, you've had places in your life that you have given your identity to or looked for your identity from. And we all know how easy it is to lose perspective on who you really are, to lose yourself in relationships or your desire for relationships at work or, or online or to an addiction. You know how you can just lose yourself until one day you wake up and you don't even know who you are anymore. You don't even know who you really are. And, and maybe you know what it, that feels like, to lose that sense of who God says you are. See, that's the big red flag from Samson's story. It's the one that we have to pay attention to in our own story. And it's simply this, and I don't want you to miss this. It's simply this, identity theft, that kind of identity theft of losing ourselves, identity theft is always an inside job. It's always an inside job. It's not out there. It's not them. It's not what they did. It's right here. It's an inside job. In other words, you don't lose your identity to others. Your job or, or your ex can't take your identity from you. You give it away. You give it away. I give it away. I trade it in on the promise or the perception of acceptance or love or value, or I trade it in or I go looking for it out of the fear of rejection or isolation or pain. Does that make sense? that that kind of identity theft, that losing of yourself is always an inside job. It's always me who does it. That's what we see in the Samson story. And that's what's true of my story. That's what's true of your story. You and I are the ones who give our identity away to so many, so many things, hoping to find our sense of place and meaning and purpose in this world. And I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to understand, like I wanna share with you kind of personally, and then I wanna illustrate how that works and what that looks like and how it can happen over time. And so to do that, I've actually asked a really, really, really good friend of mine to come out right now and see if they would actually uh, help me. So I invited, will you welcome my friend out to the stage right now, right now? Welcome him out here right now. Thank you so much for joining us here today, Jared. I am so, this is actually just from my office. I just keep this in there. Again, remember the yearbook story? I just need to make sure that there's enough of me to go around. Okay, how does this happen? How do we actually experience identity theft as an inside job. Well, here's a couple things that is so easy for me to go looking for my identity in, that I can go out and say, okay, you can define who I am. First one for me is that I go looking for my identity actually in, as a husband. I can do that. And that's not a bad thing. It's actually a great thing. So that's one of the places I can go looking for my identity is that, oh yeah, I am a husband. I'm Jeannie's husband. She is my wife. That kind of gives me my value. Or I can do it as a father. I can say, you know, like, this is my identity right here. I'm a father. And listen, next to Jesus, uh, being Jeannie's husband and being Elijah and Gigi's dad is the best thing in my life. I want to be really clear about that. These are the best things in my life. These are very, very, very important things to me. But if that is where I find my identity, that's actually a red flag. Why? Because it's always connected to or contingent on them. Who am I if they're not a part of my life? Who was I before they were a part of my life? See, it's even a good thing can be a red flag when I'm hanging my hope of identity on someone else. Another one for me is I love 
being the, one of the pastors of this church. I consider that a tremendous privilege. I love that I get to write books and help people find and follow Jesus. I love what I get to actually do in the world. But I want to be really clear, as soon as these things become my identity, as soon as I find my worth, my place, my meaning in being the pastor of this church or being the author of books, that's a red flag. Why? Because I only am who I am because of you. You see how that works? I'm only good if you all think I'm good or say I'm good. My worth and my value then is directly tied to you or to book sales or to whatever it might be. And y'all are good people, but you don't need that kind of pressure in your life. You don't need needy me going, how am I? How am I doing? Tell me more. I can't, that's a red flag if I wrap my whole identity. And I know a lot of pastors. I know a lot of pastors who find a lot of meaning in the size of their church or their influence or how big it is or how many books they sell, how many people are following them online. And I know how easy that is for me to lose myself trying to find myself there. Does that make sense? So I, I could go on. I got more and more, but I guess I want to ask you to consider, as you think about your life and, and the circumstances that surround your life, the question for you to consider is, who are you giving you to? Who is it that you are giving that, that sense of self, that God-given identity? Who gets that in your life? Who are you actually giving you to? Who, who out there defines what's in here? Maybe for you, it really is kind of wrapped up. And again, there's nothing wrong with this, but it's wrapped up in a relationship, right? It's all about this relationship. And you're so grateful to be in this relationship. But if you're to be really honest about this relationship, you know deep down or it's becoming clear now that you do not actually share the same values. You've been dating for a little while now and you're realizing like, oh, they really don't care about this thing that I used to care about. And why don't I care about it as much anymore? And you maybe if you're to be honest, you see that, Boy, as much as I have invested in this relationship, I don't know that we're, are we mutually building each other up? Are we better because of each other? And what you can find over time in this relationship is that lots of relationships is that you always end up settling to the lowest common denominator of value. So even good relationship, you're always going to settle down to the lowest common denominator. So if your identity is all wrapped up in that, I mean, that's something to think about. It might be a red flag. Or, or maybe for you, your identity isn't wrapped up in a relationship, but it's in the desire for a relationship and what you're actually willing to do to be in a relationship because you want to be in a relationship so bad. You just want to be with someone and there's nothing wrong with that at all. The red flag comes when you begin to change who you are to get someone to tell you who you are. When you go out there trying to win someone over, or win some sense of self, changing the way that you treat your body, what you eat, what you don't eat, lowering your sexual standards that you've set for yourself. Maybe you're afraid to truly be yourself because you've begun to tell yourself that there must be something wrong with you and that's why you're still single. You see how there can be so many red flags when our whole identity is, if I could just be with someone, if I could just be with someone. Again, not a bad thing, but it becomes a red flag when it's everything to me. Maybe for you, it's a classic one. Maybe for you, it's work, right? And, you, and you'd say, oh, no, I'm not a workaholic. My dad was a workaholic. My mom was a workaholic. I'm not a workaholic. But maybe if you were to do an honest assessment of your life, you'd find that you're actually giving the best parts of yourself. You're giving the best of yourself to people who tomorrow could fire you. <laughs> I mean, that's just kind of how it goes. <laughs> could replace you. And so how much, do I, how much of my identity do I really want to have invested in that stock? Maybe for you, when it comes to the way that you work, you know you're operating outside of your limits. Or if you have a family, if you're married or you have kids, you know how many times you've cheated on your family for work. Believing that if you just worked a little harder, if you just put a few more hours in, then, then, then you'll be who you want to be. When in reality, you're just trying to be who they want you to be. Maybe for you, it's your, your net worth, right? And we get all kinds of stuff wrapped up in where we're at when it comes to our net worth. And you've begun to believe that you are what you actually own. And so it's all about, okay, now I need a little bit nicer clothes, higher end clothes. Now I need a nicer, newer car. Now I need a, a bigger, better house, you know? And it's all about how much you've got in your account. Maybe for you, it's, it's actually your online persona, right? It's how you project and portray yourself online. The pictures that you perfectly pose online, right? Your hot takes and all the hotbed issues that 
that other people post about. And maybe you found yourself without even realizing it, living and dying by likes and follows. And you're so caught up in, per, in that persona, that projection that you've lost who you actually are. What do they like to see? What do they like when I post? What do they, when I post, I get this many likes. And we lose ourselves and we lose ourselves. And we, I could go on and on and on and on. We could all walk up here with little post-it notes and go, uh, here's mine, here's mine. Because this is what happens. This is what identity theft looks like. It's, it's always an inside job. <laughs> it's always me. I'm always the one that gives myself away, trying to find myself in what others say, trying to find my worth or value outside of me. So who are you giving you to? See, what I think we miss so often in, 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 in Samson's story, when you just kind of read it or you've heard it, or what I, at least I know what I so often miss in my own story is that there's only one who can give me my true identity, one constant and true source that gets to say who I actually am. Only God. That's the, that is the, the most credible, reliable, dependable, unchanging source of identity. Only God only the one who formed you from the inside out gets to say that there's nothing out there that can dictate or determine what he put in here. Nothing out there is better than who he says you actually are in him. Only the great I am, that's the name that God gave himself. Was said, how do I know you? How do I describe you to others? God says, here's the only name you need to know. I am, I am, that's my name, I am. And only I am can say who I am. Only I am can speak over all these other places where I go looking for myself. Only I am can actually say it. No one can actually take that away from me. No relationship can actually take that away from me. No heartache or heartbreak that I'm going through can actually ever destroy me. No amount of success can actually ever define me. Only I am gets to say who I am. And maybe, maybe, maybe you just need to be reminded of that today. I am says who I am. I am who I am, says I am, and that is enough. That is enough. Who God says that I am is enough. That's enough. And maybe, maybe what you need is just, because we've got all these other places and all these other ways and all these other people in our life, like Samson kind of went out sort of looking for identity. Maybe you just need to be reminded of who God says you are who you are in him. Maybe that's the whole reason that you're here or you're worshiping online. And so if I, it's just, I just want to take a moment and maybe one of these, two of these resonates with you. I just want to declare who you actually are in him today. Do you know the truth of who God says you are? God says, I am his child. I am God's child. That means I'm adopted and I'm brought in to God's family. Do you know God says you're actually created in the image of God? I don't know what you say when you see yourself, but God says, I see perfection because you're made in my image. You may be the only glimpse of God that anyone ever gets in this world because you are made in the image of God. God says that you are chosen. You are chosen. He may not have chosen you. They may not have chosen you. They may have passed you by, but God says, I choose you. I know everything about you. I know even the things you think you're hiding and I choose you. I am chosen by God. And that means that I am accepted by God. He knows me. He sees me. He brings me into his family in relationship with him. In fact, the Bible even tells us that you are actually forgiven. I am forgiven by God. And so often what ends up happening is we go back into our past and dig up things that God already forgave and said, see, that's who I, that's all I am. That's it. I'm only as good as my last mistake. God says, wait a second. I forgave you. You're forgiven. You are set apart. You're set free. In fact, God says you are actually a new creation. You, the old has gone and the new has come. That is who I am. I am a new creation. And here's the good news. I am actually a work in progress. Please have patience. This is a work zone. I am a work in process right now. This is what transformation looks like in my life. And in fact, the Bible says this is who I am. The Bible says I am God's temple. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. You got up and came to church today, but God says, no, there's already a temple right here, right now where the Holy Spirit dwells. You actually have the Holy Spirit of God in you when you are in relationship with God. You are actually God's temple. In fact, God says you are part of my family. 
You are brought into my family. You are adopted. You are brought in. You are given full status. Bible says that I am actually blessed and equipped to handle whatever may come my way. Blessed beyond measure and equipped beyond anything I could ever imagine. Blessed with everything that I need for life and equipped with spiritual gifts to handle things that may seem bigger than me. In fact, when obstacles and challenges do come my way, you know who God says I am? God says that I am more than a conqueror. He says the battle's already been done. I get to walk into the future claiming a victory from the past that Jesus settled thousands of years ago. I am more than a conqueror. In fact, God says, as you go out into the world, you are are my ambassador. You actually bring the light and love and joy and hope of God to this world. Why? Because I am God's beloved, loved by God, fully, wholly, completely. That is who I am. That is who I am. And so much more. And only the great I am gets to say who I am. And I can go out there looking for it in other places, but they will always disappoint. No man, no job, No 401k, no amount of followers online can ever give you that. So why would you give that away? Why would you give up on that? Don't give away what God has already given to you. I am says who I am, and that is enough. That is enough. And so the homework this week for all of us to do, and I really want you to consider doing this. We've done this a few times throughout the history of our church The homework this week is to do what I just did right here, is to grab a post-it note. Y'all got post-it notes at home or in your office? Just to grab a couple post-it notes and maybe just take some of these and we'll try and share these online. Bianca, we'll share these online this week, right? Yep, that's in front of all these people. She says, yes, we will. Yep, okay, good, good, good. We'll share some of these promises of God about who you actually are, your identity, and maybe you claim some of those. You write it down on a post-it note and you put it where you need to see it. So I know two places where mine are going. Mine's going on my mirror where I look in the morning And I got another one going here in the office at work. Why the mirror in the morning? Because there are all kinds of things I say to myself when I see myself every morning about who I think I am or what I think I need. And I need to be reminded, no, 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 no. I'm God's beloved. I'm I'm actually, this is it. I am beloved by God. That's, if that's all I know, if that's all I got today, that's enough. Put one here at work. Maybe you need to put one if you drive or you commute. Put one on your steering wheel. Maybe there's one related specifically to traffic that you just need to, I'm an agent of peace. You know, just put that right on there. Wherever it is, would you do that this week? Would you take a couple and just say, no, I need to, I need to be reminded and I need to declare it. Because if I don't, I'm gonna go looking to someone else. I'm gonna go looking somewhere else. I'm gonna go looking outside for what God said is already inside me. So that's our homework this week, to remind ourselves to declare that. Can you imagine how it might shift or change your day if you did that this week, like what you have facing you this week, how you walked into it, or or even just this whole week, to have that perspective, you know, whatever comes your way, like, no, 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 this is true, this is true, this is true. How that might change your whole life, your relationships with others, to just claim who I am says that you are. So that's my hope. That's my prayer. That's what we're about together this week. And I want to ask you to stand and I want to pray for you. If you would, please stand. And I want to pray. And we take a posture of prayer around here where we open our hands. I just, it says a lot just by opening our hands saying, God, I want to receive who you say I am. And I want to offer all that I am to you. So if you'd be willing to do that, just hold that posture. If it helps to close your eyes so you can concentrate, then I just want to pray that over you right now. God, thank you for this Story. I mean, first and foremost, God, thank you that you use broken people like Samson. You know, you just, there's not a perfect person other than your son Jesus in the entire Bible. That's it. Only Jesus. Everyone else, just like us. And so thank you, God, that you use imperfect people, that you change us and you transform us. But more than that, God, thank you for, for who you say we really are. Thank you, God, that you not only formed us, but God, you are for us. You formed us, God, in our mother's womb. You knit us together, every part of us, God. You put us together. And not only that, you said, I am for you in this world, that you are for us being all of who you created us to be. So God, would you help us every time we go stealing our identity, giving it away to someone else to come back to those truths of who you say we are and that that is enough. That is the blessing that you have for us, that you get to determine, you get to declare who we are. And God, what we wanted to do is declare who you are back to you now in this moment. And so God, be with us in our worship, we pray in your name. 
Hey, thanks so much for watching. My name is Brandon and I'm the Transformation Pastor here. Our hope is that this message encouraged you. And if it did, don't forget to share this link with a friend. Also, hit that subscribe button so you never miss a video and so that you can become a part of our global church online. And for more information about who we are or for giving information, feel free to visit our website. You'll see a link down below. And I hope is that we'll see you back soon.